whether it's domestic or international, or both. And beyond that, you know, there, there are other things like you know how to uh, capitalize the uh, the patterns you have. You know, a lot of universities, a lot of you know, companies you going through, do they do they license the technologies, the patents, and so on? Uh, but I think the more exciting is to actually to actually uh, start a company to commercialize, to turn the, uh, uh, the patents into products. Okay. And even, I think even more exciting if you can turn the technology into a standard so that the people of the world can use that. Okay. So uh, I think I was lucky enough to be able to do you know, bits and pieces in all these three different aspects. So uh, I'll focus on these three uh, through two examples. Okay. The first example is how about uh, mainly about the standard value, uh, the technology of um, My talk will be uh, focused on you know, cybersecurity. Cybersecurity. So uh, this may not always applicable to some other areas. I understand a lot of people in this room primarily IT studio, so I think that's pretty straightforward. I'll look back to the slide again. Uh, this, of course, I'm not saying this is the ideal one. It, it's not always applicable to all the research. For example, if you're doing fundamental research, basic research, uh, I think probably what you have is this, right, most of the time. Okay. So for applied research, for research which is uh, in the technology area, I think that this is the one. Yeah, I think it's for that. Okay, so by doing this, I, I'm not implying that all research had to be done like this. Okay, for fundamental research, uh, this probably is not the ideal cycle. Okay, back to uh, topic number one. Uh, in security, uh, there are three, people say there are three important aspects of security. Uh, they happen to be through CIA. Yeah, everybody here on CIA in the last couple of weeks. Uh, but the CIA here actually we stand, uh, stand for uh, C stands for confidentiality or security of data. I stands for integrity or authenticity of data. And A stands for availability. Okay. And there are a lot of technologies we can use to uh, achieve the three different aspects. One of the, uh, the, I suppose, the most important tools we have is uh, crypto techniques or encryption. Okay. Uh, crypto basically uh, are used to achieve primarily two goals, two of the three goals, the C and the I. C is for the company sharing of data and I for the integrity of the data. Okay. And I have a little more, more details about you know, how this is done. Uh, for example, to, uh, to provide a confidentiality, uh, there are broadly two types of, of, uh, of technologies we can use. One is called a symmetric encryption technique. The second is called an asymmetric encryption techniques. Uh, sometimes people call a symmetric uh, encryption called private key. That's fine. That's the same thing. Other times, you know, people call asymmetric encryption call it a public key. Uh, they are basically the same. Okay. For uh, integrity and uh, authenticity, again, there are a few different ways you will do that. Uh, for example, if you have trusted third party, uh, someone you can trust, someone you can trust by all the users, uh, then the solution will be a lot easier because you have a third party which will help us to do all the application. Right? Uh, Otherwise, if you don't have someone whom you can trust, uh, we have to use something else. Okay, typically, we use what is called a public key uh, signature, feature signature, uh, to do that. Okay. Uh, now, most people are doing uh, in crypto research, they would focus on the top half of the slide. They focus on you know, how to design all these uh, techniques, all the mathematical you know, uh, tools they, they have, or physical tools. Uh, they try to you know come up with something which would be confidentiality or integrity or both. Okay. Uh, from my point of view, I think that's not, not enough. 
And I think the, the bottom half, the second half, oftentimes is more important than the top half. But basically, uh, I think the cost, the overhead, for any solution you might have had, overrides everything else. Because that actually decides or determines whether your, uh, the idea you will technically develop will be eventually used by other people. Okay. So I, I think the cost overhead is so important. Okay. Especially given the, all these new devices you know, popping up all the time. Everybody has a smartphone now. And what is the largest uh, the problem you think you have with a smartphone? And everybody has different experiences. I mean, my experience is that the battery dies up pretty quickly. Uh, I think a lot of people do agree, you know. A lot of people, in order to have iPhones, I see people have like two, three uh, batteries, you know, uh, carry them all the time. And, uh, you know, if you it can cause all the time, uh, the battery just die up pretty quickly. So you have to have some of the charges and so on. So, why that happens? Uh, a lot of reasons. I think one of the reasons is that the computation, uh, which the phone is doing all the time, consumes you know a lot of juice. So you you, you have to think about that. So uh, if you are using uh, encryption techniques, you will find that the juice will run out even quicker because of the computation over large numbers integers. They're pretty expensive. So uh, it's basically this kind of trade-off. You have security, but you have to pay something for that. Uh, the pay, uh, the cost you have is the, the time the phone has to consume, and also energy to the battery. Right? So therefore, find some solution which has minimized computation, minimize the delay, minimize the consumption of battery. Right? Obviously, that's you know pretty uh, important in practice. So how do you do? Uh, uh, in the digital world. To talk about this, we have to have to come back to the physical world. You know, this is a slide I've shown people for a number of years, although I, I have to admit, I don't do that anymore. Okay. I find myself that I don't write a letter anymore. In the old days, or, you know, I wrote a letter to my father, my mother, but now I don't do that, and I just call it. Right? But if you still do that, you, you write a letter, and then you, uh, you, you sign at the bottom of then you fold it, uh, slide that into the envelope, seal it, send it off. Uh, if, if, if you think about it, you know, what you're doing, the purpose of doing that, to sign the letter basically is to, uh, to, to attach the authenticity to the letter. So that whoever receives the letter, they can, uh, hopefully they'll be convinced that it, it is from you, not from something else. And of course, the reason that we put that in there, we perceive it, uh, is that we hope that you know, uh, no one else will see the contents. Okay. So uh, sign it and then seal it. That's what we do in the physical world. Uh, it turns out in cyberspace, uh, we've been doing this for the very beginning of modern data security, back from the mid 1970s. I should have stayed in the 80s because the 70s, the technology was not even here. So we do something very much similar. We do that in two steps. Step one is to affix a, what is called a digital signature to a digital document. Okay. And afterwards, we, we encrypt it. Okay, encrypt it. So there are two steps. Now, it turns out these both steps are pretty time consuming. Okay. Anyone who has been uh, exposed to data security would know that we use what is called, uh, typically use what is called a marginal exponentiation over huge <coughs> numbers. How big the numbers are? Hundreds of digits. Okay. Uh, or hundreds of bits. Uh, and right now people are you know, talking about at least 2,000 of digits, uh, bits. Okay. Which translates about uh, 700, uh, 700 digits. So how, just think about it, 700 digits, how big it is. Think about the piece of paper you have. Uh, how many letters you write a line? 
think he's studying the old days about 1860 letters if he's a typewriter, right? So if you have 700 digits, we are talking about 10 lines of, and not only just 10 lines, each has about 60 to 70 letters, digits, right? Pretty big numbers. And working out all these numbers is pretty time consuming. You know, you know, the machine will be busy, your smartphone will be busy. In the background, you do all the, uh, uh, the computation. Right. Uh, the exact how this done, uh, we use what is called a public encryption. And it's got a digital public key, uh, digital signatures. Okay. Uh, these two slides, uh, hopefully, I give you some idea of how this is done. Uh, to do public encryption, we have a pair of keys, pair of keys. Okay. Uh, in this scenario, we have two users, Alice and Bob. Bob has his public key already registered in the public key directory, which is something like the other pages. And Bob P uh, is deciphering secret key in a secure location. So when Alice wants to send a message to Bob in a secure way, what Alice does is go and fetch the Bob's public key from the yellow page. And then use that to encrypt messages into ciphertext instead of the internet. Okay. And uh, Bob receives that and Bob uses the matching private key to decipher. Okay. This is what is good asymmetry for public key technique. Now this slide Gives us an idea of some basic idea about how digital signature works. Uh, it looks quite complex, but uh, pretty straightforward. Okay. Uh, again, there are two parts. Bob actually is, is different from the bar we had earlier. Uh, the, the second is uh, someone's called uh, Cassie. Bob wants to sign a document so that Cassie uh, or anyone else can verify the authenticity of Bob's signature. Later on. Okay. What, what Bob does is that. Uh, again, Bob has a key pair, a public and private key pair. Bob would publish uh, you know, the public key in the yellow pages. So Bob uh, is going to use his private key. This time it's called the signature generation key <coughs> to sign, to digitally sign the document. Okay, the end result is basically something like this. Uh, you have document and you have a signature, basically it's uh, it's a sequence of bits, random bits. Okay. And this pair together will uh, form what is called authenticated document or signed message, something like that. Uh, anyone else, such as Cassie, can verify the authenticity of the signature by first and looking up Bob's property and get a copy of that and then use that key. Uh, together with the verification algorithm, which is basically just a program that uh, sits inside your, your computer, does the verification. Okay, so pretty straightforward. So in digital world, we do <coughs> something basically as similar to what we would do in the cyberspace. In, in physical world, uh, we, you know, yeah, you digitally sign it first, followed by uh, encryption. Okay. As I mentioned, it turns out this is pretty uh, time-consuming and also uh, at the same time, we actually expand, we enlarge the message as well. I hope this slide gives you some idea. Uh, the top square uh, indicates the, your message you have. Okay? And after you sign it and encrypt it, you end up with this top part plus the bottom half. Okay? The bottom half has two parts. Uh, basically, the part one and the bottom part is it's your digital signature. Part two is something you have to have to do public encryption in order to, uh, for, for the receiver to be able to recover. Okay? So without any details, so basically you have to, you are going to expand your message. Okay? How long these expanded parts are? <coughs> it depends. It depends on technology use. Sometimes it can be big, sometimes it can be short. Okay? Uh, in a lot of applications, public key uh, techniques, in fact, they are used for what is called key transport. You actually don't uh, secure messages directly. What you do is you pick a what is called a message key and use that uh, 
the key will you know, will be uh, placed in, instead of a message M. Okay, the key typically actually short, a couple of hundred bits. Okay, and imagine that you want to secure a key which has let's say 200 bits, and what you will find is that the, the added bits will be thousands of bits. So in order to secure a 200 bit key, you have to add two or three thousand more bits to do that. Okay. To me, that's a question. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's not really optimal. Okay. In fact, that was one of the motivations why uh, I started to think about the whole thing. A better way, efficient way to to do encryption and signature. So this might give you some ideas <coughs> uh, about the cost involved. There are two different aspects. One is the computational cost, how much time basically you have to take in you know, order to, to encrypt it and to sign it. The second part is the, uh, what is called communication overhead. It's the added bits you have. Okay. Give you some ideas. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about details, but basically you have to spend a lot of time to do the computation and your message gets very large. Okay. If you do that in the traditional way, we do. Uh, this question is, can we do it in a better way? Can we do better? Okay. And uh, the question, I started asking this question kind of many, many years back. And uh, you know, looking back, that's, uh, uh, that was a good question to ask. ask. And uh, you know, people, actually a lot of people ask me, how did you uh, start to ask this question in the first place? Uh, a few years back, I was asked to, to give a talk about this, in fact, to, to talk about the background information. Uh, uh, how did I basically get started to ask this question? And the answer pretty straightforward. In fact, the answer was that I was lucky enough at the time when I was doing PhD with my uh, advisor. Um, he was actually one of the ideas, uh, pioneers in discovering what is called coded modulation in red, highlighted. Uh, at the words, coded modulations. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how many people are, uh, you know, have communication data uh, background. Basically, that's a technology for efficient data communication. Okay, and uh, I think it's still being used in some communications. And in the old days, certainly, it's been important for cable, you know, communication and so on. Uh, if you're old enough, you know, uh, there was time 20 years back, you know, we had to use dial-up modem to kind of internet. And every year they would come up with a new type of model, you know, modem, you know, that will be double the speed we had in the past. Okay. You would rush to get a new modem and hopefully get a fast internet, right? And the reason they could do that was actually use coded modulation technology. Okay. So uh, a little bit of, uh, more about coded modulation. This, this is a typical communication system we have. You see the bronze we have? Right? The top is the, uh, the, the sending part, the sender, the bottom is the rubber. Receive. Okay. Now this is a very highly simplified uh, diagram for the communication system. But to give you some idea, what are the uh, steps involved uh, to, uh, to communicate a piece of data from one end to the other? Okay. You see all the blocks. Uh, the middle, the, so, uh, the red one is about security. And then uh, the first step is source coding, basically to translate your analog information data into in digital format, okay. And the left hand side, it's about error cracking codes and <coughs> modulation, okay. Uh, that's important because the communication links are not quite reliable. The, there are errors, so you have to add an error cracking code so that the receiver can crack to the possible errors. Modulation <coughs> is important, obviously, because the, the data you have, uh, you know, they have to be, uh, Think of data as goods, okay, and you have to put them into trucks before you can transport the data from one end to the other. Okay. So, so what people did in communication is use uh, discover uh, invent what is called code modulation. Basically, we were able to co combine the last two steps into one. Okay, error cracking codes and the modulation uh, could be done in one step. That was a significant invention in the late 1970s. Okay. And quickly after the invention in the 80s, technology became an international standard. And from the early 90s, you know, people 
was trying to use that in cable modems. Okay. So I, I found that was fascinating, uh, and partially because you know my advisor uh, was was one of the inventors. Uh, so very fascinating. I was thinking about how we can learn from that. What can we use? The ideas behind project motivation in security. Okay. I have to admit that I wasn't the only person thinking about it. Because I personally didn't know there are quite a few people, my friends, and uh, they were thinking about the same problem. All right? And they actually basically, this is a, this is a question asking, okay? I was asking that a few other people were asking the same question. <coughs> so how is it possible to combine authenticity and uh, confidentiality in a single step? Right? So that's a question. So of course we know that you know uh, now we can do that use what is called sign encryption, okay. and I had some specific goals in mind when I was thinking about that. Uh, this slide tells us the specific goals. I want to achieve two functions. To provide two functions. One is called confidentiality of data. The second is authenticity of data. Okay. And specifically, I want to be able to provide uh, what is called non-repudiation. Basically, that's the function of the digital signature. Non-repudiation. Okay? And additionally, the bottom half of the slides tell us that I want to achieve a technique which has far smaller cost overhead compared to, you know, uh, the regular uh, traditional way to do that. So I hope that last, you know, uh, the line, the equation can uh, convey the idea. The cost of the, the new techno encryption is far for two, uh, you know, uh, smaller, smaller size. Basically, it's far smaller. Okay. Far smaller. The cost of the you, uh, you do is, do that is the signature and encryption separate. Okay. Now th there are quite a few techniques we can do, and I'm not going to dive into the details. Okay. I do have a couple of slides to show you how this is done, okay, so, but I'm just skipping it, okay. So, if you do want to find details, uh, we can talk about the later on. Uh, so, the, the end result is that the, the, the cost uh, can be reduced significantly. Okay, this slide shows how much savings with this sanction in terms of computation we can have. Okay, so the, uh, you see the green part, green bar is basically for the, it's for the new type of sanctuary. Okay, the, the other uh, reddish uh, the bars are for the more you know the traditional one you you would have to spend. Okay, now the the uh, the numbers at the bottom, the uh, 1024, uh, 2000, uh, something before 8000. The, these are the uh, parameter size, if you like, the size of the keys you have. Okay, so right now we are at 2048. That's what we have now. Five years later, we may have to use 4096. Ten years later, maybe 8000 or something. Five years ago, ten years ago, that was at the beginning, 1024. Okay. So the reason I understand is because as you can see, the radio keys, and as a result, the savings actually is bigger over time. Because the uh, uh, if you have imagine there's a curve, curve like this, and this one, and the, the last one, the, the growth of the curve is different. Okay, the rate of growth is different. Okay. So as the parameter gets bigger, the saving is actually far bigger. Now that's in terms of computation. Now what about the communication overhead? They added the number of bits we have to have. This is more, uh, even more dramatic. Uh, the, the new tank right is at the bottom, okay? And the other two, you know, grows so quickly. And the sanction basically, it's, it, it grows a little bit, but it's, it's pretty much, you know, it's, it's the same, all the same, okay? Not much compared to, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the traditional way you have to spend, okay? So this is more dramatic. Uh, so and the result are basically, uh, 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 you know, I've, I've tried to think about how to explain this to uh, someone who may not have 
calculate your background. About a watch sign between us, okay? I come up this slide, basically, think of this as a magic envelope. Magic envelope, okay, six. Okay. It's envelope made by yourself, for yourself. <coughs> you write a letter, you compose it, and you don't have to sign it. Just fold it, put that envelope, seal it, and send it off. Okay? You don't have to sign it. You basically have one step on. You compose the letter afterwards, basically you put that in the envelope. And you send it over and this, uh, whoever receives that, you open it, open it, okay? And magically, uh, your signature is also on the message. So that's just one way uh, to think of this. Uh, I think what sign is. Okay, uh, it, it's it's basically is a magic way to for you to do uh, you know two things in one, right? And of course, I mean we have other saying about this. You know, two, two words in one stone. Okay, when I was uh, when I'm here in the U.S. in other parts of the world, I'm telling the uh, you know uh, actually in Australia we use one boomer to kill two kangaroos. <laughs> All right, that's uh, uh, not cute to kind of protect it. Right? But here, you know, this time for the North Americans, so we'll, we'll get cute to ducks with one, uh, you know, where. Well. So that's legal, that's, that's a lot. Okay. So once an application was signed, between numerous, numerous. Practically, uh, uh, it can be used as a drop in replacement of. Any application you have where you have to do both a signature and encryption. Okay. One good example is that for online commerce, everybody, you know, when you go uh, for online shopping, uh, you make sure the HTTPS is turned on. Uh, S basically means what is called SSL. Okay. Uh, you can actually uh, use something as a dropping replacement. Speed up the, uh, the computation transaction. Okay. Uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, have been thinking about how to use the technology. What is called a sensor network. You know, these tiny little uh, sensor devices and so on. Uh, they may be battery powered, but they all have limited battery size and so on. So, you know, power consumption is, uh, is problems. So think about this. And other people are thinking about how to use that in a secure in a voice over IP. Communications, okay, and there are many more. You know, of course, the uh, after the the, te the paper was published, there are a lot of people had all the different extensions and so on. But basically, add all these bells and whistles. Right? There are a lot of different techniques, and even myself cannot keep up with it. Okay, so that's the technology side. Now, let's move on to more exciting part: how to do the commercialization. The, the last, uh, you know, the piece of the puzzle, right? the cycle. Uh, Sanctity uh, was uh, the idea came up, where, you know, in 1996, and immediately the patterns were applied. Uh, in fact, I still remember, you know, that's many many years back. I drove up to the, up, you know, the CBD areas quite a few times. It's other side of CBD. There was a, a couple of, you know, patent offices over there. You talk to lawyer, explain all this and that, and so on. You know, had a few times. Uh, it was very time consuming, right? And the patterns were applied, the papers were published. The first paper was in 1997, <coughs> okay? And that was the, uh, the, the techniques described, but there's one missing piece uh, that is to provide a formal, rigorous mathematical analysis of the security of the technique. That didn't happen until I was lucky enough uh, to have two students. One of them sitting here is over there, and as a professor at Monash, uh, Rome, and other one uh, is a professor uh, somewhere in the Middle East. <laughs> okay. uh, so the both the professor now, uh, they, they worked from, uh, with me for quite some time, and then we figured this out, the proof, uh, and we published the, the paper in 2002. Was that it, uh, PKC? You can see in uh, Switzerland. Paris. 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 Paris
Yes, you have better memory than that. <laughs> uh, so, and patterns were applied to both in Australia and the US. And there, I still remember there was, uh, there was a decision to be made whether, uh, of course, it had to be in Australia first. Then the question is, you know, uh, should we uh, apply, you know, uh, country separately or worldwide? If we don't do that, you know, which country we should uh, uh, pick? I think there are a few options, why is the US plus Japan plus the EU? And uh, all the cost calculation, so, uh, you know, they, uh, they decided to, not me, <laughs> decided to Australia plus the US, okay. And it's pretty time consuming and the, you know, a lot of time, uh, also money, of course. And the cost, not just for the, the patent application, and you pay the lawyers and so but also has maintenance fees. You know, I'm sure you, if you have patents, you know that. Uh, the patents grant, great, congratulations, but if you think that you can, you can now pay it there, you know, that's, that's wrong. <coughs> you will, every year we have a matter, uh, uh, patent office, you know, asking you, could you please send us a check? All right, because we have a maintenance database, and you know, taking care of that, you have to help us there. So, a lot of ongoing costs. It's expensive. Uh, I guess because of that, you know, uh, you know, most of the time you, I don't see people applying at it individually. But two reasons why is that, uh, you know, most people work for some organizations. They typically have IP rights, not you. Okay. The secondly, you know, the cost involved, the time involved, you know, to hire lawyers and so on. Uh, it's just not quite feasible for people to do that individually. Uh, so that was the, uh, the Paddington stage. Once that was done, uh, you know, uh, I still remember a lot of communication with the lawyer because the uh, the patent office will examine or look at the patents. You know, they have yes, some of the claims will be uh, basically killed, and other other claims will be amended and so on. Okay, so very time consuming. And once that was done, I remember I think the, the patents in the U.S. was granted. I think that was 2002. Australia one was easy. That was like a 12 months. We got it. And the US one was like five, six months. Uh, five, six years, I think. Uh, I was happy, you know, uh, Monash got the patents. And, uh, and then a, a few years later, uh, I think that was 2006, without my knowledge, uh, ISO, ISO, which is international standard, I think, you know, was actually looking into turning the technology into international standards. Okay. And in early 2008, I got an email, uh, quite a surprising uh, email, saying, you know, when I'm looking into, you know, set up a standard on uh, science fiction, uh, I you know, wonder if you can help us. Uh, of course, I was very happy with that, because my understanding at the time was that uh, to get something to study was not easy. Typically, you have to push. You have to push. And that's why a lot of companies, large companies, they have people dedicated to that. They want to go to all the meetings, all the meetings, to push the attack. Okay. So in this case, it was completely out of the room. Uh, they were doing that, you know, uh, no, I was pushing that. No, I was pushing that. Okay. So they were doing that, and then the, once they decided to do that, uh, they asked me to help. So. Of course, I was very happy to help. And the, there, are quite, there are few standard bodies relevant in IT area. Why, you know, in this case, ISO, ISO. But there's also IEEE. Okay. And then there is uh, what is called IETF. That's the internet standard. All right. And of course, there are a lot of national standard bodies as well. Okay. So, you, you have to think about, you know, if you do want to tackle, you want to study uh, which direction should it go. Uh, in this case, in my, I'm talking about, you know, uh, about the ISO experience. Although I do have, you know, I was involved in IEEE as well, okay? They, they, they operated quite differently, okay? ISO is a very uh, large organization. They have uh, regular meetings, and they have, uh, you know, quite a complex, okay? Uh, what I was uh, associated with in the past few years was uh, what is called uh, 
SC27 and WD2, working group number two, basically. Okay, that's where all the uh, impression technologies are synthesized. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, they start looking into that in 2006, 2008, uh, the whole process uh, was kick-started. Uh, they have a number for that, like all the standard, you know, the standard they were looking at. And finally, uh, it was complete uh, at the end of 2004 years and efforts. Okay. Uh, a little bit of background information about ISO. Uh, this is something I learned over the course. I didn't know that at the beginning at all. It turns out it's, it's quite complex, the process. Uh, this slide shows you six uh, big stages. Uh, you know, uh, uh, any standards, uh, you know, uh, has to go through if you want to turn something into an in, in, in international standard, okay? Uh, each stage, you would actually have sub-stages, okay? Uh, quite involved. Uh, I was told that I was lucky because uh, the, the standard of our science fiction took uh, four years, which was the minimum amount of time uh, that was possible, minimum. Some actually took a longer, far longer uh, you know, time to do that. Okay. Uh, one of the things I learned is that uh, prior to ISO, actually, I had experience with IEEE uh, standards. Okay. So uh, that was sort of more uh, mainly about you know, uh, composed of people from industries. Uh, but uh, ISO is different. ISO, in a way, it's like a mini version of United Nations. Each country has one vote. It doesn't matter how big or small the country is. If there is such a good small big, okay? so everybody basically has equal votes. Now, although uh, you know, I have to say the the, the, the different uh, the votes have different weights. Okay? It basically depends on how active that country is involved in the process. Uh, if, if if your country is you know highly involved, your vote will be counted as a full vote. Uh, if your country is sort of, you know, dormant over you know, a lot of time, you, uh, you may not, occasionally, you may not be able to vote. Okay? So basically, it's one punch, one vote. Okay? Uh, one thing, uh, most uh, important thing, uh, as I learned, is that uh, <coughs> myself included people in the academy are basically were very familiar with, uh, uh, you know, design, build, something, what I call textbook version of technology, or okay. They are great, they are good to explain to students, okay? but not all the time they are usable in practice. So therefore, uh, to turn something to standard, you have to convert, transform that into a robust technology which can be used in practice. So that's something certainly, you know, very, uh, you know, new experience I learned. And as I mentioned, a lot of, uh, you know, face-to-face -face meetings, in this case, about this particular working group, they have two meetings, physical meetings a year. Uh, in addition to that, you have a lot of online discussion, phone conversations, all of this. Okay. It's, it's a very complex, uh, long uh, process. Uh, I can talk more about this, but I, I think uh, uh, my time sort of running out, but I, uh, I'll just quickly summarize what, what I had ex uh, you know, experienced with, with ISO. Um, a lot of, uh, you know, you have to overcome quite a bit of challenges, especially for people like myself from academy. You have to have time, you have to commit your time. Uh, you know, you have to find, try to figure out the fundings, because uh, two travels, two trips a year, it's, it's, uh, it's you know, in all different things, all places, far away, you know, it's, it's not cheap, right? And you have to be, able to work with people from uh, all different countries, all different, uh, you know, uh, culture background, all this, okay? You have to be able to answer, you know, handle questions you don't like, okay? And basically, sometimes you have to try to be a little political, but not too political, okay? That's something, you know, I, I sort of learned along the way. And, and also, you have to understand the importance of uh, Issues which are non technical in nature but very important. Things like usability, simplicity, and so on. Okay? The, 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 there's no mathematics behind it, but they're important. 
or something to be part of standard. Okay. The overall, I think, in my personal experience is I think I was very happy with uh, you know, the opportunity to be uh, involved in the process, although it took me quite some time and uh, energy and so on, and I was happy with that. And of course, you know, uh, turn something, your baby, into some standard so that everyone can use that. Uh, it's, it's a very happy experience. And as I mentioned earlier, how to turn text to put a version of algorithms into something which can be used in, uh, you know, in real world applications. Uh, that's certainly very uh, an interesting experience. And of course, over the, uh, the course of standardizing all these you know, technologies, you learn a lot of things. You talk to people from industries. You find out, you know, you figure out sometimes, you know, the, the, the things you wouldn't just think if you're sitting in office. Okay? And the last thing I want to mention is that if you do have interest in that, you should uh, talk to you know, national bodies or international bodies, uh, you know, uh, contribute to the process because they are constantly looking for expertise in that. You know, there's always a gap between the uh, what we know when we do research and uh, and what people actually try to standardize. Okay, so to minimize the gap, the only way is to have input. Okay, if you want to influence that try to get in, uh, involved into the process. So that's the sort of standard document. It's not very fancy, but the black and white. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. uh, if you are interested in the, uh, more about Cyclotrin, uh, we have a website about that. Okay, the next step topic uh, is about a startup. Uh, so this is a totally different technology. Uh, it's, uh, it's in the network security area. Uh, we have a, a name for that. It's called IDF, uh, Internet Defense. Basically, it's a system, uh, a distributed internet scale, larger scale, attack detection and prevention technology. Okay. And a little background information about this: we uh, we start to think about this, uh, uh, you know, this problem. When we look at all these solutions available at the time, that was more than 10 years back, at the time a lot of companies are selling individual devices. Just like the routers you have, you know, the, the file, firewall boxes you have, okay. And these devices didn't talk to each other. So there was a question, you know, uh, everyone was you know, thinking about how to, how to connect all these devices together. That was the, the question. And we have our way to uh, you know, solve this problem. And we actually, what we sort of uh, you know, uh, start to think about this uh, the problem, we were looking at the evolution of our history, human uh, you know, society. Uh, if you think about it, we, in a way, I think the cyberspace mirrors what we happened, what happened with our history. Uh, initially, people, you know, the human, you know, the out of Africa, there were some tribes try to defend themselves, right? And gradually, you know, try to form, you know, form the villages, uh, little kingdoms, and so on, and finally, you know, uh, nation states, which is actually not to new, it's about 100 years old, right? And while this happens, you know, the defense system organization also evolved as well. Now every, every country has defense forces. It's well organized. So the idea is that, can we uh, learn something from that? Okay, so IDF, International Defense Force, is, it was one of the outcomes uh, of this land system. So, technically, uh, this is a very high level description of that idea. It's basically have a, a, a collection of nodes. Nodes basically at the bottom, you can see it's actually, physically it's a device. It's like a rod, okay? Uh, inside the rod it has a piece of software, right? The software is you know, it's a component of the idea. Okay. The, these nodes have two different types. Okay. Why is it regular units, regular nodes? Okay. Then second is uh, the command, the commanders. Okay. So uh, in a way, it's actually not very dissimilar with the uh, the narrow, you know, the Skype narrow you have, uh, or there's some of the P2P narrow. The two types of nodes, one, most of them are just regular nodes, but uh, some of the nodes have 
slightly different function, they were acting as a command. They're organized uh, in such a way that they can talk to each other, but not to everyone because uh, they will be overwhelmed. Okay. So that was the uh, idea. And if, if the technology can be deployed in its full, full scale, uh, the goal at the time we <coughs> was all about this was to have these three major you know, functions. One is that it can detect what is called a zero day attacks. Zero attacks basically means attack which you haven't seen before yet. Okay. Uh, if the attack is already seen by you, you can create what is called attack signature. That will make your life a lot easier. But the trouble is that what happens if there are new attacks, attacks we haven't seen before? Okay, that's called a zero-day attack. And more importantly, you, uh, you, you find an attack, you do the and, and real time analysis. How do you prevent the attack? Okay, how do you prevent <coughs> all attacks? Okay, so you have to find a way to rapidly dispatch possible solutions to that. Okay? And of course, hopefully, there will be what is called a fault tolerance. You know, just like the uh, human uh, you know, the bodies, you know, if a part of the body is you know, hurt or damaged or uh, overall, I think we still function. Right? So, something like that. So. The, the technology, uh, we had this idea uh, about 2002 and uh, quickly uh, convinced the university to apply for patents for the technology. And, uh, I, and then, of course, you know, everybody will do you know, published papers, that's 2003. Okay. And as soon as we realized the potential of this technology, uh, we decided to set up a company in 2003. Okay. And and then also uh, the, the, there was a uh, annual uh, yearly uh, uh, competition, business plan competition. Uh, local, you know, it's local universities, uh, faculties, and staff, students, they would uh, you know, uh, join this business, you know, five ventures competition. Uh, well, Lucky was one of the winners, and uh, got a little bit of funding, you know, a few thousand dollars to start the whole thing. Run at a full speed to develop a prototype uh, of this product. Okay. And 2005, we had a prototype ready, and uh, we have secured, secured external venture funds and also brought in land from our side as well. Okay. And I think at the beginning of 2006, first the customer were, uh, was secured. That was the most exciting part, just like, you know. Everyone would you know, imagine you, know, you spent so many years to do that, you know, so much you know, money and time and everything efforts. You, you have you have to first a customer, excited, happy. Right? And of course once you have one, you know, then the, the question is, you know, how to make it <coughs> more quickly. Right? And so uh, by the time uh, you know a few years down the road, 2008, and uh, you know, it's completely you know external management or uh, you know, complete control and uh, business basically was uh, ready to, uh, you know, to move ahead without me. So I decided to try to do the business. Uh, that's sort of rough uh, timeline you know, we had with this particular uh, you know, uh, adventure. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the patterns were applied pretty quickly by university and because uh, it's expensive. And the company formed and uh, the initially, there will be uh, basically a two-way two ownership, basically the funders, you know, myself included, and the university. The university uh, uh, became a shareholder uh, because the, you see, the, the technology was developed at the university. The university owned the rights, okay? The university applied a patent for that, okay? And the, the company developed something out of these patents, so the university had to license this, uh, the patents, the IPs, the whole portfolio of all the relevant technology to the company. As a result, part of the company becomes university. Okay, that's the whole idea. It's a, the joint ownership. Okay? So uh, uh, the product actually, it's pretty straightforward. It's actually, you know, it's, it's a physical, it's just a box. Okay? It's like a firewall, okay, or a router. Okay? Uh, but actually, uh, uh, the company doesn't sell it, okay? It doesn't sell the boxes, okay? 
what the company sells is actually services, security services. This box is part of the package. Uh, you got to ask why, that's super. Uh, it's a business model. And you, if you sell the box, you get a one-time money. You sell this to sell the box, right? That's it, right? Uh, but as a company, as a business, you want to have recurring revenues. Okay, so what they do is instead of selling the box, you say, this is a service you provide. Okay? And you have this many uh, people in the company, you have these three locations. Why well, didn't you install all the boxes at different locations for you? Well, you install software, or do you have regular updates? All right? So you have basically subscribe service. And there will be different levels of uh, memberships. Okay? So if you have, say, weekly updates, if you have your 24-7 you know, uh, available, so if something happens, you pay this much monthly fee. If you say you're technically competent, you, know, you, have, you, know, you want to regular updates about it, you, you don't. You don't expect when you to call 24-7. You maybe have second you know, level of service. And so so that's basically it's, uh, part of the pattern. Okay. And the target uh, in our market was, uh, was for SMB, small, medium-sized business. Okay. Uh, the reason was that I think after some marketing uh, you know, analysis, uh, we figured that that was the next sweet spot. Because in large businesses, you would have to compete head on with like Cisco, uh, which was tough. So you, you know, focus on SMB, you have a better chance to so that's basic experience. Um, I think that one of the questions we have is funding. How do we get the funding? Uh, that's the tough question. Okay. Now, first of all, you have to figure out what are the possible sources for funding. Okay. Uh, in this case, we uh, did some analysis. We found there are a few possible approaches. You know, different colors in here. Uh, the bottom one part of funding is kind of new. Okay, I just figured, you know I found this out you know lately. It's, uh, it's kind of new, but it, traditionally you have four different types, you know, ways to, to fund the, your uh, your venture. Okay, you of course uh, initially you're going to have to you know put your money into that. Okay, With your friends, your relatives, yourself. Okay, the good thing is that the pie is 100% is yours. Okay, you can do that. Now, if you're lucky enough, you can convince the banks. You can borrow money from the banks. That'll be great too. You still have to pay yourself. All, all, you know, all the pie is yours. You, 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 you borrow money from the bank, you, of course, you repay interest. Right? And the bank basically doesn't have a part of the okay? uh, Of course, it's going to be tough because you have to convince the bank that you, know, you can, uh, you, you can, you can borrow money and later you can have the ability to return money. <laughs> so, <laughs> what typically people do, of course, in the venture capital stage of venture capital, but the idea is that. You, you, uh, you, you, you convince people to put money into the, the, the business. And as a return, you know, you have to carve up for the time to this different pieces, parts. You know, you, everybody has some. Okay. Uh, it sounds like it's smaller. But actually, the hope is that over time, the pie gets far bigger than what you have now. So that even like 5% of the pie over two years' time, uh, you know, will be far bigger than the current whole pie. Now that's of course it's complex, it's not so simple. You have the contract, but also also what is called booty rights and all this stuff. Because yeah. uh, you know, the, you know, if you have bigger portions of pie, you have more rights to decide, you know, direction of the company, you know, you know, all this stuff. Okay, so it can be very complex, very complex. You do need a lawyer to help you if you do that. Okay, you can't do that yourself. And if you also can get, uh, if you are lucky enough, you can get some money from uh, the government. I think Australia has something similar to, you know, the government occasionally, you know, they hands out money, innovation funds, something like that. Okay, these are grants. Basically, mean that they're free money, free because the government gives me your money and they don't expect anything to pay back. If I give a report, okay, so these are free money. They don't touch your pie. That's good. But, uh, you know, uh, the, the competition can be tough, can be very tough, okay? So the last one is crowdfunding. This is a new thing, which I'm trying to figure out what this is about. <laughs> you know, do a Google search, you'll find out this, uh, this crowdfunding. 
Uh, I think it is very important, the institutional support, the university level support is very important. Uh, this is my personal experience. I think, uh, you know, there's one thing I think the US university, they typically, they're very much inheriting uh, adventure startups, commercialization of your time. I think uh, to uh, Canada, something I think similar to that. I think that they have a, the, the, the the whole system has been set up. You know, they, they learned this over the past 50 years. Okay, most universities they have people dedicated to uh, what is called a technology transfer. Okay, but in my case, we have what is called an OTP, Office for Technology Transfer. I was very lucky because one of the uh, director who had left us uh, was a great guy. He was experienced. In fact, he was one of the uh, became nationally known to help university startups. Uh, he was basically my mentor and helped all the you know numerous possible ways from setting up connections with people, you know, introducing to them to uh, capitalists, all this. And in fact, he also acted as a like, kind of lawyer, you know, free, unpaid lawyer as well. Okay. So, you know, it's very important to have some something like that to help you. Okay. And they have actually, you know, has a, every year they have a competition. Okay. It's called a five inch company, as I mentioned earlier. Basically, you, if you have any ideas, good idea, you have a competition. And uh, it's done uh, by university together with. Uh, uh, the people, you know, most local people who are rich, who have some money to spend, uh, who are happy to, you know, give up some money. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is something different, uh, the last part is that the, uh, some of the universities have a startup incubator. Okay. Uh, in, in my case, they have what is called a research park, which actually is a big area, which a lot of companies there, it's joint venture between university and a local all these, you know, incubators, companies, all this. Okay, so and they get the support from, of course, governments as well. Uh, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier as on the slide. SPIR, which is a, a federal government funding mechanism. I think it's a great idea. I want to just talk a little bit. Of, I'm not sure. You know, we have something here. Uh, it's it's basically it's a, there, there's a law uh, which was uh, you know established a few years back. The law basically says for any federal grants large enough, basically over $100 million in size, <coughs> you have to set aside 2.5% of the money to support a commercialization of the research which would have come out of this uh, grant, basically. This, I think, is a great idea. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's actually it's it's a lot of practically. I think you know, I put the search. I think all these major uh, departments, funding agencies, they all are part of this part of the program, and they all set aside if the if the funding is big enough, hundred million dollars, or they always set in two and a half percent. Okay, so yeah, if you can, you apply for that. Again, it's a grant, and it's free money if you can get it. Okay, and typically you will support after three years. Not a great amount, like maybe it's like under hundred thousand dollars, but that's good enough as a startup. So uh, that's a great idea. Uh, that's pretty much it. But the last point is that okay, we talk about all the commercialization. Uh, I think that's, at the beginning I mentioned in ninety nine percent of the time we don't do this. So the question is when not to commercialize. That is simple. Okay, very simple. Uh, you know. Uh, if, if, if the research, the, uh, the basic research, it's no practical use. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned it 10 years time, in 10 years time, maybe five years, I think really. I think if it's not immediately usable, forget about it. Okay. Uh, uh, if it's usable in the next couple of years, now, start to think about that. Okay. Now, of course, having great solutions is not enough. You have to make sure that you can secure funds. You have people. Uh, you know, uh, other than yourself, you have other people working with you, and and also you, you know, you're ready to commit yourself, both in terms of time and so on, possibly money, uh, into the, you know, roller coaster, <laughs> right? Okay, and uh, all this. So, 
Uh, uh, my view is that you know, if, if, if you find that you, know, you cannot do that for whatever reasons, I think that that's fine. That's fine. I, I, you know, I think this part is that you know, we should realize that you know, you, you, we always stand, everybody standing on somebody else. Okay? Even though you, know, you cannot commercialize now, maybe somebody else will pick this up later on. Okay? So it, it's, it, I think it's pretty fine. So, but if there's a chance, you think it's good to do that, uh, you, know, uh, you should not miss it. I think that's it, and uh, I'd like to thank Deakin University's program as a thinker in residence, right? Not simply residence, thinker residence program, and thank for uh, you know the uh, department for hosting me, and of course, uh, I'm so much grateful, Lynn, uh, for making everything you know possible. Thank you very much. Thank you for this very exciting and very you know stimulating talk. What is well, have a lot of questions to ask you. So if, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask them. Question. Um, were, were, were having patents on sign encryption, was that a hindrance for getting the standardization done? Uh, for ISO? No. Uh, they don't care about this, in fact. Uh, Maybe in the past they, they care a little bit, but in, uh, I think now, I see if, from what I see, the most uh, you know standard bodies, they they are forced to not to care too much because practically all these technology have patents. So I think that the ISO has basically say you know we don't care about these patents, but when we decide this, you know we're going to stand on this, we'll have an open period for people to tell us you have rights on this. I think like a six months period. Uh, so that if you do have rights, you have to declare this, right? and then they will just move on. So in this particular case, uh, it's not relevant. But for IETF, would be different. They tend to prefer, you know, open source uh, tech. Uh, for IEEE, I think that we don't care much about patents. So it, it, it depends. It depends. Else was asked, asked <laughs> the, um, so yeah, so you, you had some difficult uh, decisions about um, um, what we patent and how widely do we patent it because of the costs and the ongoing costs. So after your experience with the patents, um, have have they been worthwhile? Have, 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 have putting the money in the patents. I mean, I mean, do you, do you get money back from the patents, or do you just need it to be able to go? Do you need it to form the company, even if you don't get direct money back. I'm just trying to work out. Yeah, that's, value, that's, that's an excellent question. I think it all depends on the business, you know, you know, uh, business not right, but I mean, universities, or companies, and so on. You know, I'm talking about universities. They have to think carefully. They have annual budget. Not great. I think in my university, I think it's about under dollars Not much at all. So that's the money. You know, you can use for patents, uh, patent applications, right? So you have to decide. They have office to make all the decisions. They look at, you know, commercially how bad it goes. Okay. So I would say the, you know, faculty, you know, the staff, you know, professors, they're putting up all application, you raise their hands out, and this is bad, you know, you know, I think the 90% of the time they don't care. Okay. Because of the limited funds available. Okay. So they clearly they're looking at, you know, the viability of the commercially, you know, and as to where to apply the patents, uh, that depends on the uh, specific area. Okay. In the IT security, uh, at the time, of course, the landscape is shifting all the time. You know, 10, 15 years back, at the time, it was US <coughs> and, and the EU. That was it. China, India was not on the map at all. Okay. But now, of course, different. Now, if you have technology on the patent, I think you have to consider uh, North America, US, Japan. China definitely should be there because you know it's becoming bigger, and the EU, the EU is basically one.